Uh, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Washington Outsider. With you today is Irina Zuckerman, I'm the editor-in-chief, and Matt Bryden, who will talk to us about his recent article and the issues facing Somalia and its role in the Horn of Africa. Uh, Matt recently wrote a very, an excellent piece for the elephant, um, essentially explaining how jihadists are taking over um, are taking over everything, taking over the government, taking over the aid that's supposed to be going to fight, in, uh, to fight Al-Shabaab and why that's actually uh, really not happening. The article is called Fake Fight, the Quiet Jihadist Takeover of Somalia. And before we get into the meat of this issue, Matt will tell us a little bit about his, himself and his background and how he ended up at a think tank in Nairobi working on uh, these issues. Thank you, Irina. Um, it's a real pleasure to be joining you today and um, trying to unpack a little bit the issues in the, the article that you've mentioned. Um, my involvement in this part of the world starts um, some 30 plus years ago uh, when I, uh, I started as a humanitarian uh, aid worker uh, at a time when this was a very different uh, region, the Horn of Africa, and uh, at the end of the Cold War, we had uh, uh, governments across the region that were essentially um, autocracies, military governments that were dependent on the superpowers uh, for support. And as the Cold War ended, uh, several of these governments collapsed, including Somalia. And um, my first uh, assignment as an aid worker was in southern Somalia. Uh, providing relief for, for refugees. And then with the collapse of the government, working as a, as a medical, uh, with a medical team, um, coordinating their political and security arrangements. And so from there, because 30 years, you know, it, it's been a long time and I've covered a lot of ground. Um, basically, I've moved from humanitarian work into um, much more political analysis. Uh, Somalia was a failed state. It had no government uh, to, worth the name for about 20 years. And so the challenges of how do you stabilize this kind of territory? Um, how do you stop uh, two decades of, of civil strife and violence and contribute to uh, restoration of governance and stability, security? These then moved to the fore. Now, that was before, that's around 2000, 2001, that Somalia got its first transitional government. And uh, 10 years later, of course, with 9-11, uh, the focus shifted very rapidly to counterterrorism efforts. And so I found my involvement in politics and governance uh, also acquired a, a very strong security focus. Uh, the organizations that I worked for at the time uh, including at one point um, as an advisor to the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi that was covering Somalia, uh, we were looking at the jihadist threat, the extremist threat, where it had come from. And I would say that that's pretty much dominated my work over the last um, uh, 15 years, oh, 10, 11 years or so now. And um, my most recent jobs uh, prior to, to what I'm doing now um, included being the, the leader or the coordinator of the United Nations Monitoring Group on Somalia and Eritrea. Uh, so basically investigating and reporting on arms embargo violations, threats to peace and security, um, a whole range of, um, of transnational security threats, including terrorism and piracy. And, and then uh, in 2012, when I left the United Nations, um, I co-founded a, a think tank for peace and security in this region, which I'm still an advisor to called Sahan. And uh, we're working on many of the same issues uh, to, to the present day. Well, we are seeing that the entire corner of Africa is suffering through a crisis. Sudan had a series of coups, failed coups, semi-coups, purges, whatever you want to call the, the government's instability. Uh, Ethiopia is dealing with a devastating uh, civil war. Eritrea just got Eritrea military just got sanctioned 
by the U.S. government, both sides in Ethiopia had been sanctioned, but the U.S. government to little uh, effect, as it seems at least in terms of their activity on the ground. And Somalia, Somalia has a very strange kind of election preparation going on that is kind of in limbo and has been in Understandably, many Americans and Westerners in general are not paying close attention to what is happening. Recently, there was a report about Iran-produced weapons, which had initially reached Houthis in Yemen and made their way through the Red Sea to Somalia uh, and for distribution and use in local conflicts and measures. But at the same time, Somalia has been also exporting a great deal of more sophisticated weapons. Uh, with the help of foreign governments uh, formally and not through these uh, illicit uh, routes. Um, how did it all begin? Why is Somalia so important to so many actors? And why didn't anyone else stabilize the situation following that failed state scenario that you described? That's that's a really important question, and I don't think anyone has all the answers. Um, first of all, Somalia collapsed in 1991, which was the same time that the then government of Ethiopia collapsed. It was shortly after there'd been a coup in neighboring uh, Sudan. Uh, Kenya was going through a, a multi-party uh, transition to multi-party democracy that was uh, very difficult. Um, so this whole region was in turmoil, and and I think some would say it has remained in some form of turmoil ever since. Now, uh, that was also the time of the first Gulf War. So while this region was in desperate need of international uh, support for stabilization, uh, most of the major powers were looking elsewhere. Be that as it may, if you fast forward 20 years and, and there is really no sufficient explanation for how Somalia was allowed to remain a failed state uh, for, for two decades, breeding terrorism, um, jihadism. We can talk a little bit more about that, what was happening in this territory called Somalia that, that had no national government um, during those years. In, uh, in the year 2000, Somalia got its first, uh, what was called a transitional government, which really didn't function, it just controlled parts of the capital, Mogadishu. Um, it didn't last its full four-year term. It, it would sort of unravel halfway through. And then we got another transitional government that was supported by Ethiopia and for some time by the United States in 2004. Since then, we've seen a series of, of transitional or provisional governments, uh, each one sort of taking Somalia a little bit closer towards meaningful statehood, uh, and, and institutions that could stabilize the country. Um, and I would say the most, the greatest progress was under the previous government between 2012 and 16, where um, Somalia sort of adopted a federal structure to try to balance all of the political and security interests in the country, uh, put checks and balances on the emergence of a central government, uh, we started to have a political consensus around uh, what the federation would look like. And then in 2017, uh, a new president was elected, uh, Mohamed Abdullahi Farmajo, who happens to be an American citizen. And he brought to Somalia uh, and to his, his position a very centralist, uh, un unitarist uh, orientation to sort of dismantle the federal architecture and concentrate all powers in the capital. Now, what we have to understand is that there isn't a lot of power to concentrate in Mogadishu. Uh, the power really remains uh, in the hands of foreign governments that are financing uh, Somali leadership. And the government itself relies on an African Union mission called AMISOM, the African Union mission in Somalia, for its own survival. If you remove these African Union forces, the chances are the government would collapse. So in these last four years, uh, President Farmajo tried to centralize power. And that is something that the vast majority of Somalis um, are resistant to, fought against previously. And so um, his government has remained uh, 
largely weak and ineffective, um, dependent on foreign monies. And therefore, the, the primary threat to peace and security in Somalia, and some would say the region, the terrorist group Al-Shabaab has had the space to grow, to expand, to enrich itself, um, and has become arguably um, uh, more powerful than the, the transitional, the provisional federal government of Somalia itself. Now, from my understanding, there are several foreign states operating in the area. Turkey, uh, which has uh, invested significantly in Somalia, Qatar, which has been mostly backing political actors, rather, you know, but uh, it also has quote unquote charities mm -hmm. established in the Horn of Africa, which have also been accused of smuggling arms back and forth with little reaction from Western governments. And we are seeing China operating there for more geostrategic uh, reasons. And more recently, Egypt has gotten involved in humanitarian diplomacy to offset the Turkish Qatari kind of influence, but that's fairly, fairly new phenomenon and has had its limits as far as I can see. When and how did all these countries become involved in, in Somalia exactly? Um, well, it's, it's definitely a very complex region with a lot of external powers taking an interest in what happens in the Horn of Africa and in Somalia in particular. Now, um, under previous uh, transitional governments or federal governments, as Somalia has been evolving, the main player in this part of the world has been Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And Ethiopia uh, favored a decentralized federal Somalia. Some would say that Ethiopia actually was the architect of Somalia's federation. Somalia never had federalism before. And so and this is- talking come... about the Ethiopia which government specifically, or is, has this been consistent across the government? Well, this was the approach of the previous Ethiopian government, which was in power for 30 years until almost 30 years until 2018. Now, yeah. under the new uh, prime minister, uh, Abiy Ahmed, who took power in 2018, Ethiopia's um, strategic position, its, its orientation vis-a-vis -vis Somalia and also its other neighbors changed dramatically. And so an Ethiopia that had been supporting federalism in Somalia became anti-federalist and concentrated its support in Mogadishu. At the same time, um, the federalist project or orientation in Somalia had been supported by other powers in the region, notably the United Arab Emirates, uh, mm -hmm. with the backing as well of Saudi Arabia, uh, but the Emirates being um, in a, a federal a federation of sorts uh, in its own right, uh, was in a position to support that type of arrangement in Somalia and was working with uh, the federal member states, these different regional governments of Somalia, to balance the formation of a, of a central government. Now, in 2017, we have a new president come to power uh, in Somalia who is centralist, who's authoritarian. Uh, the Ethiopian government changes and switches its backing behind uh, Farmajo and supports the centralist project. The Somali government um, also in terms of the disputes between the Gulf states, particularly the Emirates and Saudi Arabia on one side, Qatar on the other side, um, declares itself neutral but aligns itself with Qatar de facto and becomes a client state of Qatar with Turkey as a kind of uh, operational partner, training armed forces and building infrastructure and so on. So Somalia moves into the Qatari Turkish camp and they are supporting a unitary state, a powerful national government and uh, essentially anti-federalist. And that's where for some time we saw the Emirates and Saudi Arabia and others pushing back. Um, but I would say for the last two years, that um, that support from the Emirates and the Saudis has, has essentially dried up. They've backed off. And so the central government, the federal government in Somalia has basically had free reign. It's been receiving money, arms, training to try and impose its vision of a unitary Somali government. And have those countries been all involved 
uh, started to give him out at about the same time since the collapse of the original government or was, or was it later at some point? Well, there've been a lot of phases because um, prior to the collapse of the Somali government in 1991, uh, a lot of Arab states actually supported the military dictatorship of mm -hmm. Mohammed Siad Barre. And then when his government uh, collapsed, uh, there was a loss of interest. We saw the Europeans, the United States uh, coming in essentially for humanitarian reasons. Then in 1992, uh, under uh, President Bush, we saw a massive, um, probably the largest humanitarian operation uh, ever to that point, Operation Restore Hope, with uh, over 30,000 troops, most of them American, coming in to deliver to secure Somalia for humanitarian assistance. Um, of course, that ended with uh, more or less with the notorious Black Hawk Down episode with a United States withdrawal, the United Nations following suit uh, to a large degree. And then a period I would say of uh, limbo where only the, the neighborhood regional states were involved and major powers backed off for a long time. It's only after uh, 9-11, that we see the United States come back with a serious interest in counterterrorism, and that ramps up through the 2000s for various reasons, including, of course, the presence of Al-Qaeda in Somalia, but also the formation of what became known as the Islamic Courts, and then out of that, uh, Al-Shabaab, the Al-Qaeda affiliate in Somalia. Now, there have been a lot of changes up until roughly uh, the late 1990s, um, the funding for jihadists in Somalia had largely come from countries like Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Kuwait. Um, but post 9-11, we see a shift where they start shutting down funding for these jihadist groups. And the ideologues who had been hosted in those, in, in those countries uh, moved to places like Qatar, and Qatar in particular, becomes now the refuge of a lot of political Islamist movements that are no longer welcome in other parts of the Gulf. And I think from there, we see the alignment, the, the beginning of the alignments that to this day, with Qatar on one side, beginning to involve Turkey. And I think Turkey's support for Muslim Brotherhood movements worldwide is, is also key here. Um, but with Saudi Arabia and the Emirates now opposed to the emergence of political Islam in the Horn, um, trying to uh, initially trying to, to uh, contain this phenomenon, but um, for a number of reasons, backing off, realizing they don't really have strategy to counter what Qatar and Turkey, uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea as well, um, are, are trying to build in Somalia. And so um, Somalia starts to move in a very dangerous direction, uh, which is authoritarian, autocratic, and also a sort of post-jihadist Islamist dispensation. No, it's very obvious that the Ethiopian government is not Islamist. Why would it align with these states that are pursuing religious, uh, you know, a theocratic kind of model that's rooted in very politicized version of, of the religion that would seem counter to the Christian majority country? Well, the issue of political Islam in Somalia is, is um, very complex. It's also very nuanced. And over the last decade or so, uh, elite politics at the center, the, the groups vying for leadership of the federal government, have largely been from various Islamist origins. We've had some from uh, different branches of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, we have Salafis uh, with ties to Saudi Arabia um, in particular. And then we also have what I would call the Al-Sahwa group, which is the more militant um, jihadist group that gave, or ideology that gave rise to, to Al-Qaeda and, and subsequently then to, to the Islamic State or Daesh. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Al Safwa is that group, uh, the awakening movement that was at one point in the 90s finally banned in Saudi Arabia, and it included preachers like Salman Al Ude, who had 
allegedly inspired uh, Osama bin Laden and who had links to these African movements as well, from what I understand. That's, that's absolutely right. And what we saw in the early 1990s was that uh, bin Laden was exiled from Saudi Arabia and moved to Sudan, so very much in this part of the world. And he brought his core Al-Qaeda or his embryonic Al-Qaeda organization with him and was hosted by an Islamist government in Sudan, in Khartoum. Now, looking for allies in this region, um, he linked up with a group called Al-Itahad al-Islam, which was a Somali jihadist group with very similar ideological orientation. People had been to the same universities, same, uh, some of them had experience uh, fighting in Afghanistan. They wanted, um, after the collapse of the Somali government, Al-Itahad um, saw a bunch of warlords fighting for control. And they said, if we want a proper Islamic government, we have to be armed as well. But they didn't have the means. They had some sponsors from uh, Gulf states and Saudi Arabia in particular, both private and, uh, and governmental. And they started to arm themselves and to try to impose themselves. Bin Laden found an ally, a willing ally in these groups and in, in al Ittihad, And so they embarked on this project together. And Bin Laden was particularly interested by when the American uh, military arrived in Somalia, um, he saw a way to um, lift up the profile of Al-Qaeda and issued a number of statements, one of which famously said, we're going to cut off the head of the snake in Somalia. And his organization moved there and fused with al Ittihad. And when we look back, we now know that uh, some of the operations of Al-Qaeda and Ittihad at that time were being financed by organizations set up by Safar al-Hawali and other sheikhs from Saudi Arabia from the Al-Sahwa movement, one particularly uh, based in Ireland, of all places, uh, called Mercy International. Uh, and it was uh, Safar al-Hawali's organization. And the money from Mercy International was funneled through Nairobi to um, al Ittihad's southwest Somali base. There were Al-Qaeda fighters there, internationals from all over the world. Um, and that, that was the last, uh, the last base of al Ittihad in Somalia. It was finally crushed by the Ethiopian government um, because it had also been launching attacks in Ethiopia. But what we had was this Al-Sahwa ideology now um, that was already an international ideology that emerged during the Afghan Jihad that inspired bin Laden and his followers and also helped to give rise to this Al-Ittihad movement. The problem is Al-Sahwa never died. Mm -hmm. Ittihad was destroyed. Uh, but what we see is that it then split into two movements. One was um, what we would call Tandim Dawa, so organization and preaching. It was political, economic, and proselytizing. The other wing was, was the jihadist wing. So al Ittihad split into al Ittisan, which was the proselytizing political economic wing, a lot of businessmen, a lot of teachers, university uh, professors, uh, leaders of mosques, imams, and then the jihadist wing, which became known as Al-Shabaab. And it's these two movements now that um, 20 years later, 15 years later now, are coming back together to try to dominate the political scene in Somalia. But as a last comment, if I come back to your question, this has not been an obvious overt uh, movement. It has been very gradual uh, and it has been very carefully uh, camouflaged under the guise of governance, civil society, state building, um, and with allies who are not from these movements, who are just opportunistic uh, politicians or political entrepreneurs, who wanted to be part of government at the different stages, who do not share the Islamist ideology, um, and yet who provide, probably in many cases, um, an unknowing uh, cover to what Ittisam and Al-Shabaab have been um, collaborating on, colluding on for a number of years now.
from you you mentioned in your article coming back to that that this type of uh, this type of ideology was not native to Somalia as a whole, that actually most people there are of Sufi orientation and while the Sufis have their own militant uh, groups, uh, ideologically they're not closely aligned with these movements. How did they manage to become so successful in an environment that is not overall um, friendly ideologically? Well, it, it's a very good question. I think. Um... The, historically, Somalia has been um, not just majority, but almost exclusively um, inhabited by Muslims who practice the Shafi'i school of law. Mm -hmm. And they have been, it's been passed down through Sufi brotherhoods. So a very moderate um, and flexible form of Islam. What many scholars over the years have called um, a veil lightly worn. Uh, so if you look back to Somalia in the 1970s and 80s, you see a liberal progressive society, uh, you see um, uh, much greater gender parity uh, than you do now, and um, freedom of choice in terms of lifestyles and dress and so on. So Somalia had a, a, a sort of moderate and progressive Islamic tradition. Now from the 1970s, when Saudi Arabia's oil boom uh, started to fuel the expansion of, of Wahhabism or, or what's now generally termed Salafism throughout the region and also the world, uh, more broadly speaking, uh, we, we see this, these Salafi tendencies, conservative tendencies making inroads in Somalia and, and, and other parts of the continent. Now, there were some attempts by Sufis to fight back, but Sufis weren't organized. Uh, they don't believe in political organization or military organization. So for a long time, they were um, marginalized, subjugated, either by the warlords who dominated the, the first 15, 10, 15 years of the civil war, or then by um, these emerging Islamist organizations. So it's only in 2007 that we see what I, I've called militant Sufis emerge. What happens is that it, in the early 2000s, this Al-Qaeda affiliate called Al-Shabaab emerges and like Al-Ittihad, its predecessor, it starts promoting a militant, violent, jihadist form of Islam. And uh, while it does that quite successfully, some parts of the Islamic courts and Al-Shabaab um, start to question that direction and defect. Now, this isn't because of, a, of conscience or altruism. It's because Ethiopia invaded Somalia and waged a very um, surgical uh, war, destroyed the Islamic courts as they were forming, and focused on those parts that were jihadist. And some of the parts of the Somali community that were most affected decided that jihadism was not the right choice and moved back to promote the traditional historical form of Somali Islamic practice and belief and practice. Call, they call it al-Sunnah wal jama which has, means different things in different contexts. So we see a militant Sufi organization formed to fight al-Shabaab, to fight al-Qaeda, and to restore Somalia to its previous um, to, to promote the previous practice of Islamic belief uh, and, and practice and teaching. And they were very successful, particularly in central Somalia, of pushing al-Shabaab out and securing a large part of the country from the jihadists. And again, fast forwarding to today, what is so disturbing is that the current government in Mogadishu um, in uh, essentially in collusion with al-Shabaab has started to attack these Sufis uh, as it has attacked other opposition groups. We can come to that. But essentially this government sees the Sufis as a greater threat than the jihadists and has put more, has invested more time, energy, effort, uh, and military um, combat power into fighting the Sufis than it has into fighting al-Shabaab.
And I think this is beginning to give us a very clear sense of where Somalia is going. Sorry, in your article, you mentioned um, <coughs> a man named Fahad, who essentially became Qatar's guy in Mogadishu, and who you basically stated, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> was the one who brought for Russia in. <coughs> I'm sorry. What can you tell us about him, why he decided to go that route, and why has Qatar banked on him as opposed to more political Islamists? Well, we don't know a lot about, as much as we probably should, about this individual called Fahad Yassin. Now, Fahad Yassin was a young man when Somalia uh, fell apart. Um, he had been, his, his family was... Uh, divided, his parents were separated, and he was brought up by his mother and, and a stepfather. Um, and they became refugees in Kenya after the collapse of the government. He had essentially a very limited religious education, not a, a mm -hmm. secondary and, and post-secondary education. <laughs> and in the mid-1990s, he joined his stepfather. His, fa his stepfather uh, was a member of al Tahad and took him from Kenya back into Somalia to wage jihad and to fight against, uh, among others, the Ethiopians. And so he was present at the final battles where al Tahad al-Islam and its Al-Qaeda um, associates were dismantled definitively and destroyed. And so for some time, then Fahad seems to have traveled um, Kenya, Yemen, where uh, by some accounts, he, he studied at a, a well-known sort of jihadist uh, university uh, that no longer exists. Um, but eventually, the, he, he wound up working as a journalist with uh, the Qatari Al Jazeera network. And he was very successful, in part because of his jihadist roots. And by the early 2000s, um, of course, the Islamic courts in Somalia and the beginnings of al-Shabaab were becoming visible, were becoming of interest, and very few people knew much about them, and even fewer could, could talk to them directly. Mm -hmm. But Fahad had this access. He could go and interview their leaders. Um, and this very clearly seems to have been based on his previous sort of jihadist upbringing and his membership uh, in al -Itad. Uh, over the years, uh, through his association with Al Jazeera, possibly other relationships that are less clear, uh, he came to the attention of the Qatari intelligence services and eventually returned to Somalia in politics, not in journalism, uh, trying to maneuver his preferred candidates into government. Um, he spent some years sort of learning the trade, unsuccessfully promoting candidates under a previous uh, president of Somalia. But then in 2016, he was essentially the campaign manager for the current president, uh, Mohamed Abdullahi Farmajo, and brought him to power and was rewarded first with the post of chief of staff in the presidency, and then the head of the intelligence service, NISA, which is an entirely Qatari funded uh, project. So Fahad moved from being a jihadist to a journalist, to a political lobbyist, and now is in the center of power. What's interesting is that the president, Farmajo, is not considered an Islamist by any stretch. Uh, he's an ultranationalist, populist, not particularly distinguished politician. Um, but uh, what I argue in my article is that suits Fahad just fine, because Farmajo plus a bunch of diaspora technocrats, Somalis from Norway, Sweden, the United States, UK, um, wearing suits, speaking Western languages, speaking the language that donors want to hear, is, is a sort of perfect cover for what is going on behind the scenes. And that is a security establishment, military, police, and intelligence uh, sort of core that uh, is funded by Qatar, trained by Turkey, and is fighting not al-Shabaab, but is fighting all other political forces in Somalia um, in order to establish the dominance of, of the federal government, and I would argue Fahad Yassin in particular. 
Interesting that you mentioned that because the Samari diaspora in the United States indeed seems to share a lot of the same sort of ideology and even those who are not overtly all that religious seem to sympathize uh, with, with, the, with, the, with, with the government. And this, I'm struggling to understand why. Has this government done anything to significantly improve the economic situation in the country? What exactly, why is there appears to be a growing support for Formaggio or is it manipulation of optics? Is the support actually much smaller than it appears to be? And is he just clamping down on any political opposition? I think first you're right that um, Formaggio came to power on a wave of, of um, popular support, both inside and outside the country. People who were not just politically supporting, but funding uh, his campaign. And you know, the diaspora now, many of them having been out of the country uh, for the better part of three decades or only occasionally visiting some of the youth uh, born outside Somalia, uh, his nationalist and populist appeal um, has resonated. And the notion of, of, of a great Somalia, making it a, again a power in, in the region is something that I think a lot of Somalis would like to see. Um, it's just that the way Farmajo and his kitchen cabinet have gone about it isn't realistic. And uh, it's actually alienating uh, much, if not most, I would say, of, of the Somali population in the country. And anyone who disagrees with me, I, I would put to the test and say, why is it then that his government now controls less territory than when it came to power and that Al-Shabaab is stronger uh, if he has this you know, broad base of, of domestic support? Now, Somali politics inside the country is partly based on clan, or what mm -hmm. uh, to a certain extent in other countries you might refer to as tribes, but Somalis speak the same language um, more or less um, and uh, are, gen are generally considered to be one ethnic group. So they don't have tribes, but these large families known as clans uh, do have a history of competition for power, political power. Um, and that, that competition is now alive and well and is becoming more and more acute and more dangerous as Farmajo tries to centralize power in his own hands and deny it to other parts of the country, to other clans, uh, to other what are called federal member states uh, of the federation. Um, but his, his appeal as a nationalist, I think, still um, holds some of the, uh, the diaspora um, in sway and uh, you'll still see rhetorical support. The other thing I would add is that where Farmajo and Fahad, even more than Farmajo, because Fahad is in a sense the, the brains behind this, Farmajo is a sort of useful dupe, the face of the government. Um, Fahad's been uh, very effective at using social media. Mm -hmm. And so um, many of Farmajo's critics now consider him to be a president with Facebook followers. Um, you can't find people supporting Farmajo on the ground, but you find them all over Facebook, Twitter, and social media. Um, you, um, there's even a name for them in Somalia that means the social media insects. Uh, whenever you say something against Farmajo, they all uh, gather and attack you. Or you get trolled uh, mm -hmm. into submission if, uh, if you find social media a difficult place to be. So um, I would say now that Farmajo's appeal on at one level, it's more virtual than real. Um, and this is the power of Fahad Yassin and his, his strategy. But at another level, and we mustn't forget, the money that of, uh, from Qatar being channeled through Fahad and the intelligence service and the way it is spent to set up troll farms, to promote this type of propaganda, to politicize the security forces. This is the real danger because Twitter and Facebook are not going to get Farmajo reelected or keep Fahad in his position. Mm. That's going to be money and manipulation of the upcoming uh, electoral process in Somalia. So this is where I want to get to this a little bit. First of all, 
if you're saying that the country that his whole image is based on nationalism how does that work with foreign states apparently funding all of his political uh, apparatus and operations and what and without a doubt this is you know Qatar, Turkey, and so forth, they are looking for something in Somalia and they're not doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. What is it they are seeking and why hasn't that become an issue for, for the populist national supporters who clearly can't possibly enjoy seeing all these foreigners um, intervene in their, in their politics? Um, yeah, very challenging question. I think here we really have to step back. Um, to take a broader geopolitical canvas and recognize that this competition is not, strictly speaking, just about Somalia. So first of all, um, we are seeing a period where the superpowers have declined, even, of course, the power of the United States is not what it was. There is no Soviet Union. China is an emerging power. Uh, of course, there are others. But what is happening very clear from this part of the world is that middle powers are becoming the real uh, pullers of levers of power and influence. And the, the great powers, you know, sure, they have a vote. They, they certainly, um, their voices are heard. And when they really matter, when they really care, they can, they can alter events, influence events here. But day to day, it's these middle powers from the Gulf Turkey, um, and sometimes uh, other parts of the continent that are really making things happen and shaping events. Now, Somalia is really, when we come to the Gulf states, it's really just one territory in a wider canvas, a conflict that stretches from, I would argue, Tunisia in the Northwest through Libya um, and uh, in a certain, to a certain extent in Sudan, or less vis visible, um, and uh, into Somalia, and then northwards again through Yemen and into the Middle East, Iraq and, and Syria, where we have these middle powers competing through proxies for influence. And by and large, you have um, Saudi Arabia, uh, the UAE and Egypt um, supporting anti-Islamist, but uh, in, in several cases, authoritarian, militaristic um, authorities or pretenders to government against, um, let's say, groups that have stronger Islamist flavors are often, um, often portray themselves as more civil society oriented, often with progressive um, slogans and, and uh, at least declared objectives. And yet, uh, if you look at uh, where the external influence comes from, there are question marks as to um, you know, what, uh, where really they would take their countries if they had leadership. But wherever you, you sit on that equation, the point is that these polarizing powers are destabilizing much of North Africa, the Horn of Africa, and the Middle East uh, through this middle power competition. Now, Turkey, which is not, um, proximal, it's not an immediate neighbor, has aligned itself, uh, is clearly taking a sort of more strident uh, position or uh, demonstrating autonomy from the European Union, which it was not a part of, aspired to be from NATO, um, and is flirting with Russia, is flirting with interests in the Middle East, has a, an, uh, essentially a party affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood in power, uh, and collaborates very easily and very effectively with Qatar. So in Somalia, this combination has the upper hand. In some other governments, of the, some other countries of the region, uh, you know, the Emirati, Saudi, Egyptian coalition seems to have the upper hand. So Somalia is sort of, it's just one mm -hmm. theater of proxy conflict. And um, at this stage, it almost looks as though Saudis, Emiratis, I, I wouldn't yet say the Egyptians have, have stepped back and are allowing Qatar and Turkey to define the trajectory of, of uh, Somalia's political evolution. We are looking at the situation where, where Famajo and Fahad 
are essentially looking to manipulate whatever dissatisfaction there may be to define the political trajectory of the country. What exactly are they doing to suppress and manipulate these elections? And what are the repercussions of that for the country and for the region? So here there are, there are several levels of politics in play. Number one is that Somalia doesn't actually yet have a fully sovereign, fully formed government. Its government the, is, is founded on a provisional constitution. So its powers are incomplete and undefined. And I would argue that it's a provisional government. But what the constitution or the provisional constitution says is that where there is ambiguity or a dispute between the federal government and the federal member states, uh, where the constitution is not clear, then these issues should be subject to consultation and negotiation between those two levels of government. And so in theory, Somalia should have had a four year period under Fermaggio where the powers and responsibilities of these two levels of government were defined, agreed upon, where the legislature governing the uh, legislation governing the federation should have been completed. So natural resources, revenue sharing, uh, security architecture to fight Al-Shabaab, among other things, that should have all been agreed. And then we need to agree on some kind of electoral system or representation. Now, four years, more than four years since Farmaggio took power, because he's overstayed his mandate. And almost one year later, he's still president without any sort of legal or constitutional basis. Uh, he claims that position. And none of these issues in the provisional constitution have been resolved or addressed. And what Farmaggio and Fahad have tried to do is dismantle the federation by weakening the federal member states and avoiding any negotiation over Somalia's federal future. And just de through decree, through fiat, from Mogadishu, from the capital, um, sort of reconstructing Somalia as a unitary state. So that's one level at which they've been fighting. Um, but another level, would, which is I mean, less obvious, is that Fahad has, in a sense, he's established al Tissam, the post-jihadist wing of al Tahad, as the ruling party in the presidency. And he's been populating uh, the government, federal government, and also the security agencies with members, former members of Al-Ittihad, members of Al-Ittissam, and even former members of Al-Shabaab who don't seem to have been through a process of uh, rehabilitation or turning against uh, the movement they used to be a part of. So we see a core sort of post-jihadist element inside the government. And for a number of reasons, Islamists and jihadists in Somalia tend to be anti-federal and very unitary in their political orientation. So there's a, a reinforcement between Farmajo's authoritarian unitary instincts and Fahad's Islamist unitary uh, instincts. And we are now at the point where we see a government whose entire focus politically and militarily has been to fight the federal member states, to fight the political opposition, and not once within the last four years, five years almost, to launch a major military action or operation against Al-Shabaab. Now, so here, this question is, what are they gaining from the growth Al-Shabaab? Is it just political support? And what exactly have uh, who is the political opposition and how, what has, has been their platform with regards to security in Al-Shabaab and, and these movements? Well, um, the federal member states, for the most part, have they are natural opposition to the federal government because in this transitional moment, the federal member states are fighting for decentralization of power against mm -hmm. a centralizing federal authority. Now, what Farmaggio and Fahad have done is rig elections in three of the federal, three of five federal member states to, to uh, um, appoint proxies who will do their bidding. Mm 
So they've they've sort of weakened this the checks and balances between the federal member states decentralization and an overweening central power. Then the political opposition, what I refer to as the political opposition, this is um, because there are also politicians, mainly in Mogadishu, um, who are not part of the federal member state makeup. Some of them may even be unitarists as well, but they don't agree with the direction that Farmadro and Fahad have taken the country and are competing for the most part um, as candidates to become president in the next election. And they have, some of them are very pro-federal, um, might say secular, some are from other, I would argue more progressive Islamist uh, groups. Um, there's a mix, but between them and the federal member state, what we have is a form of political pluralism, something that Farmajo and Fahad are deeply opposed to. Um, Anything, anyone who doesn't agree with them and follow their party line is subject to harassment, intimidation, assassination, uh, or um, to be silenced in, in, in any other way they can find. So that's, uh, that's basically what I mean by the political opposition. So why haven't we seen mass, mass uh, uprisings in Samaria the way we've seen in other African and Middle Eastern countries uh, when there appears to be dissatisfaction with the political process. Are, do these political opposition groups have mass followings or are they essentially just on their own and don't, they don't really represent anyone other than their own interests? I think the answer here is that we have a very immature political system, which means that we don't have parties um, that are capable of mobilizing popular opposition. We don't have other political forms of organization apart from clan. Mm -hmm. And clan is a very complicated beast uh, to manage politics on. So some clans, or many clans who might oppose Formaggio and his leadership are cautious about the position they take because they don't want to be blamed for bringing down this government some or to move against, they might be from the same clan at a certain mm -hmm. level. Um, as Farmajo, and so they don't want to be blamed for undermining one of their own, uh, even if they're different um, subdivisions. So clan politics then becomes, it's very fragmented, it's very difficult to mobilize. But what we saw uh, in, in early 2021, between February and April, in, in February, Farmajo's term of office ended. He's no longer president. He has no constitutional political mandate. Uh, and he just decided to sit in Villa Somalia um, and um, retain the title. And immediately we saw mobilization led by opposition politicians. But in fact, um, the power came from the population and mainly from the clans around Mogadishu. And so the Somali National Army, which is a very sort of embryonic force in its own right, actually split along clan lines. And we had whole units join the opposition to oppose Farmajo's self-declared extension. And then in, in April, when he tried to legalize his extension, the parliament did uh, by, by putting it before parliament, parliament's term has also expired. So they had no, no business doing this anyway. Um, when they tabled this motion for Farmajo's two-year extension, all hell broke loose. Uh, the army of, around Mogadishu essentially disintegrated. There was fighting in the streets. Pro-government forces tried to assassinate opposition politicians, but the opposition got the upper hand, and uh, Farmajo probably would have been forced out of uh, the palace at the point of a gun had he not... Um, surrendered and basically said, all right, I'm dropping the two-year extension, I'll, I'll, I'll negotiate. Now, since then, uh, he and Fahad playing shrewd politics, uh, it's been um, more than seven months since that clash. It's been nine months since his term of office extended, and he's still sitting in Villa Somalia, still carrying the title of president. And the electoral process looks like it could go on indefinitely. Um, he might still be president, who knows, in, in three, four, six months, or even a year, um, if, um, 
unless the opposition go back to the streets again or, or the electoral process accelerate. Uh, well, what would it take for them to do that? Because the two things I'm not seeing here that have been present in other countries is there is no international reporting focus on the electoral process. It's safe to say that in many other countries where that focus has been, has taken place, it was largely where Al Jazeera and largely in Qatar's interest. And of course, there's no such interest in covering the unfair elections here for obvious reasons. The other issue I'm not seeing is international American and other institutions, observers and political trainers who, who train uh, political actors in effective democratic institution building, I don't see them on the ground or I'm not hearing about their presence of training the political actors to mobilize effectively. I, without those two things, uh, what would be the catalyzing factor for people to return to the streets? Uh, since Farmaj is not clearly saying, no, I won't do this so he can play this forever. What could be? Well, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, first of all, I think one of the problems is that Somalia's electoral system for the time being is a provisional system. We don't have a law. Um, we don't have any kind of, sort of multi-party system in place. And that'll be very difficult to construct. So Somali, Somalia's parliament is uh, the lower house is based on clan. So the only way to mobilize politically and to have representation at the federal level is through clan. So it doesn't matter at the moment whether politicians lead parties or not, they have no traction. Mm -hmm. um, so we remain in the same kind of clan system that has kept Somalia divided, fragmented, unstable for the last 30 years. And we really need to get past that. It's it's extremely disappointing, discouraging to see that under Farmajo, there's been no attempt to move Somalia forward. He's exploited this clan system, um, playing divide and rule to keep himself in, uh, in, in power. Now, the, the other thing to remember is that you know, the United States and Europeans have invested huge amounts of money in trying to move Somalia into a better place. Uh, I think the, the total uh, aid budget um, that the Somali federal government and, and its donors agreed on retrospectively uh, about a year ago, it was receiving about $1.5 billion a year, including external security assistance. And the budget of the government itself is less than 200 million. So you can see the uh, imbalance here. But... Um, What's essentially happened is, is, I think, uh, I would argue an international ranking. Ethiopia next door is, has about 110 million people. It's consumed by civil war and its government may well be on the verge of collapse. Um, and there is no plan for what comes next. So a catastrophic crisis for the entire region. It's the biggest power. Uh, in, in the region. Next door is Sudan, territorially one of Africa's largest states. Um, it has been in a difficult transition for several years. The military has just uh, pulled off uh, what some would call a second coup. The entire transitional process is in danger. And we have uh, Western powers deeply invested there as well. So uh, we could also look at other states across the, the region, West Africa facing um, the rise of Islamic State, and, and, and uh, in particular in, in Nigeria, Mali, Niger, and so on. So Somalia has sort of been relegated to a lower order of priority, um, where Western interests are very much focused on counterterrorism. How do we fight al-Shabaab? We've been fighting jihadists for 30 years in Somalia. They're stronger than ever. Um, what do we do next? Because we don't have the bandwidth to do nation building and democratization across this entire region. And that I think is the trap that Fahad and his people are using because the trap is then let's negotiate with Al-Shabaab. Let's, um, we're not gonna win through military force alone. Let's talk to them and bring them into government. 
what I've been seeing across the, the board, whether in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in African countries or anywhere else, on the one hand, Western governments say we don't have the benefit to nation build. On the other hand, they're giving the money to corrupt government entities that mismanage them and that are also not nation building. Civil society is not ultimately trained and empowered to take care of their local problems. And as a result, we have a situation where these terrorist and uh, extremist organizations come to power on a promise to nation build. When they get to power, they do not do so effectively. Hezbollah did the same thing in Lebanon. They came on a promise of social jihad and robbed the country blind. And uh, we are seeing that it has become an excuse to allow extremists to come to power, essentially. There has been no negotiated approach to what national building actually entails and whether it's possible to do that effectively. What happened in Afghanistan, we've had 20 years of NATO presence with a lot of people making a lot of money of not training the military effectively, not building up institutions, only empowering some actors in limited ways, but not taking not taking it to the next level, not engaging private actors who have the logistical know-how yeah. to train the local actors. So in reality, the, you know, nation building, yes, nobody wants to invest their country's resources in building up another country. But on the other hand, if the other option is extremism, and if the third option is maybe creating some balance, balance of power between local actors, private actors, and limited and uh, with heavy oversight, government entities, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily a hopeless endeavor. Uh, yes. I'm, uh, the question is why hasn't, why hasn't that been brought up to attention in the US? Why haven't, a, uh, haven't the observers of these completely unhealthy dynamics remarked on the fact that this humanitarian aid that US and others is giving is being misspent, is being misallocated to not to fight the security threats, but to uh, suppress opposition and prevent an effective nation building by the local presence. What what has been the, the you know, it's either all or nothing approach, either we give everything to these corrupt politicians or we don't do anything at all and uh, let the extremists take over and, and then we're still stuck and then give them even more humanitarian aid because, you know, because it's the humane thing to do. That seems to be the approach and there's no rational mediation process. What, what, what's your take on that? I'm, I'm just curious because to me, it's mind boggling seeing the same thing happen and fail again and again and again and result in the same cycle and everything. And we're facing a million fires now in different places and all these approaches have failed completely. I think, <clears throat> Um, if we could just, if we just argued that Somalia was about incompetence, misappropriation of aid flows, um, it might look like some other places on the planet where donor countries have just got it wrong, misunderstood the context, the human terrain and so on. But Somalia is more complicated because what we've actually seen is, is an elite and ruling group under this government that has actually deceived and dissimulated um, its, its Western partners into, into believing that it was serious about trying to fight al-Shabaab and extremism. So part of the army, the special forces, uh, the police have been built with large amounts of Western aid and have been deployed um, nominally to, to fight al-Shabaab and improve security. And it's just not working. But where this gets complicated is that when you look deeply into uh, the operations uh, that the military has been sent on, chain of command and control, and um, the investment uh, the government has, has uh, put into these operations, what you find is that there's, there's, a, there's a lack of seriousness. The government doesn't seem to actually want success. Mm -hmm. And the, as I've argued in, in my rec most recent paper, um, the Somali National Army has been sent on wild goose chases to um, secure objectives that it used to control four years ago, but never actually finishing the operation, not opening major roads, major Al-Shabaab bases that are within 
a day's drive of a large Somali National Army and police concentrations uh, are never attacked. There hasn't been an operation against them. On the other hand, we see parts of the army, special forces, uh, paramilitary police, and of course the intelligence service that are not Western backed, they're Qatari and Turkish backed, and they're very competent and they're very capable. The problem is they're not used to fight Al-Shabaab. They're used to fight the federal member states and they're used to suppress and intimidate the political opposition. So the Somali federal government is using two different security establishments to fight two different wars. One, trying and failing, I would say deliberately, um, to confront Al-Shabaab. Uh, and then another, quite effectively, to centralize power and dismantle political opposition and the architecture of federalism. So it puts us in a situation where today, if you take the, uh, the federal government's arguments in good faith, you would say, well, we've tried to fight the jihadists. It's not working. There's no other option but to come to the table and negotiate. Um, and you would miss the fact that actually quite effective forces have been operating, but not for that mission. I don't think it's any coincidence that Qatar is among the governments that has been most vocal um, in calling for a dialogue between Al-Shabaab and the federal leadership and encouraging Western governments, um, arguing that Qatar can also be a key actor and a facilitator in these talks. And a, a lot of Western governments have thrown up their hands and said, three decades of war, of chaos, billions of dollars of investment in the security sector, we're not winning, let's talk. When in fact, their local Somali government partner is not trying to win at all. It's trying to bring them to the conclusion that dialogue is necessary. And I'll close this out by saying, if we had a federal government that was serious about a progressive, let's say, Western liberal democratic model, um, and was going to sit down at the table with Al-Shabaab and try to find some accommodation. Well, let's see where that goes. But what we actually have is a government dominated by a former jihadist group whose ideology is essentially identical to that of Al-Shabaab. Fahad is Al-Itahad. Al-Shabaab is Al-Itahad. We would basically be reunifying the major Somali post-war jihadist movement uh, under the auspices of the state and saying, you're now the ruling party. And believe me, if al Ittihad or whatever we choose to call it becomes the ruling party with it to Sam running politics and economics, Shabab largely being the military wing, we have a one party totalitarian jihadist state, not so different uh, from what we see in Afghanistan, ideologically and culturally different but in terms of um, a totalitarian jihadist rule, no, I think we'd end up with a very similar scenario. One, one final question to wrap all of this up. We are seeing that Secretary Blinken is uh, coming to uh, Nairobi next week to discuss Somalia, Sudan, Ethiopia. Now, we've already seen this administration's approach to Afghanistan. Arguably, it was started by the past administration, but they chose to continue this trajectory, which was to allow the Taliban to take power without negotiating any compromise, which couldn't be negotiated because Taliban is a radical Islamist organization that does not believe in power sharing. Now we're seeing the exact same violations we everyone had warned about, and we're seeing that uh, other power hungry groups, including former Taliban now known as ISIS-K are challenging them for power and there's internal frictions and instability, lack of governance experience because it's a terrorist organization and and so on and so forth, a co complete collapse of Afghanistan into a failed state with security repercussions for the region that are fairly uh, foreseeable. And uh, do you believe that Secretary Blinken has taken a lesson from that experience and will push for some sort of a different vision for the region, a vision that includes some sort of strings attached to disbursement of further aid, some sort of concrete uh, commitments to 
civil society sector to empowering local actors to uh, um, excluding corrupt actors from the political process, uh, education, everything that that needs to be done to counter extremist ideology from spreading and not just endless and failing counter terrorist operations? Or do you believe that you'll see more of the same from the Biden administration and as a result from everyone else who is following suit on this issue? Well, I think here, first of all, Secretary Blinken's visit uh, this week to this part of the world is probably going to be dominated by the impending, well, the crisis in Ethiopia, potential collapse of that government. And then also to a lesser extent, what's happening in Sudan. Of course, the US special envoy, Jeffrey Feltman has been very active um, on both fronts. But um, again, Somalia will likely come as a best a third priority. And in Somalia, you have AFRICOM, you have SOCAF, Special Operations Command Africa, that have, um, I would say well-established uh, both presence and, and approach. Uh, things changed at the end of the, the previous administration with the withdrawal of US troops from Somalia to neighboring countries. But the US has been supporting very effective special forces units, mm -hmm. uh, some at the federal level, uh, some at uh, the federal member state level. The, the tragedy is that this federal government has tried to disempower those units and prevent them being used for counterterrorism operations. Now, my sense is that um, the current administration, having only been in, in office for a year, is becoming aware of these issues, is deeply concerned that the federal elections could be stolen by Farmajo Fahad and uh, and their sort of Islam, Fahad's Islamist agenda, but really don't have a grasp on how this is being engineered and how to stop it. That's partly because there's still no ambassador in Somalia mm -hmm. uh, since uh, the previous ambassador, Don Yamamoto, left. Um, and it's still not, it's not a high enough priority to have the mm -hmm. full force of state and the National Security Council you know, focused on it. Uh, you can feel the orientation of the government is clear. We need to we need to correct. We need a course correction. Uh, we need you, we hear that the U.S. government is thinking of severing uh, or suspending some of the military assistance to units that are being misused under Fahad Yassin's leadership. But you know, time is not on our side. This election is going to play out in the coming months. There's a real danger that Fahad Yassin. Uh, and his little e political ecosystem will come back to power with or without Farmajo. Farmajo is disposable. But if this Islamist clique comes back into office, whoever the president is, um, however acceptable that face is for this Somali government, then we are going to have Afghanistan on the Gulf of Aden. And I would argue that then all of Somalia's neighbors, Kenya, Ethiopia, when it has a new government, um, Djibouti, Egypt, the Emirates, Saudis are all going to be deeply uncomfortable because we're going to have a government that whose priorities and global perspective are totally at odds with every other government in this part of the world. And that is going to mean that the US and the Europeans uh, were gonna have to double down on their investments, not just course correction, but actually uh, put things into reverse gear. And that's gonna be a lot harder than um, sort of quick, decisive intervention now to prevent state capture by this Qatari-backed, Turkish-supported uh, Islamist clique that has, has essentially taken control. And do you think the collapse of the Ethiopian government will have any effect on Formaggio and Fahad and that group? Will it be positive or will it be, will it help them, hurt them in the collapse of these institutions and unclear situation with investments by other countries in, in that general vicinity. to how is that going to reflect on this group? Well, it's already having an impact because um, as of three years ago, 2018, uh, the Ethiopian government, the Eritrean government, and, and we need to mention the Eritrean government because um, the Eritrean dictator, Asayas Afawarki, has been instrumental in all of this. 
uh, just playing a role from behind the scenes. But Eritrea, Ethiopia, and, and, and Somalia set up a tripartite pact to work together. Um, now we can see mainly to, uh, to wage war in the Tigray region of Ethiopia, but the war that is now leading to the potential collapse of the Ethiopian state. Now that Ethiopia is in trouble, Eritrea has withdrawn most of its forces from Ethiopia and Tigray in particular. Somalia is isolated. Those, those military allies it was counting on, those political supporters and mentors of Farmajos are now absent. So Farmajos in a weaker position in the region, but he still has that Qatari and Turkish support base. Um, if Ethiopia actually collapses, or at the best case scenario, probably moves into a caretaker government arrangement uh, with conflict still cascading into the, the regions of the country, with that massive population of over 110 million people, Somalia is like all of the neighbors is going to be affected. We're going to see massive movements of, of population. Uh, we're seeing the largest economy in this part of Africa um, tanking. Uh, we're seeing the anchor state that provided security and stability through diplomacy, through soft power, and through judicious use of force um, unraveling and no center of gravity in this region anymore. Uh, Kenya, Uganda, possibly others trying to pick up the pieces. Um, whatever one thought of the previous Ethiopian government, um, under the, the previous government, Ethiopia played that stabilizing anchor role. And it seems to me that that is about to end. And we're going to have a, a political vacuum, a security vacuum for at least a number of years that's going to affect this entire region. Well, on that cheery note, Thank you so much for the insights that you have uh, lent us. It's been an, an extremely informative discussion. And I know there's been a lot of confusion around these issues. The propaganda on social media does not help because anytime anyone criticizes the government or raises questions, oh, you're against the Somali people. No, no. I think the people who are against the Somali people, the people trying to hijack the discussion and avoid any, any scrutiny of what they're doing. Um, but uh, um, but I don't think discussion is ever against anybody. It's it's I think it, raising questions that may affect the entire region and have global repercussions is, is perfectly par for the course. And I thank you for 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 continuing important work in this area. I hope you write more, speak out more. We'll, I hope to see you here again, and I hope you also contribute articles to us as well. We are looking forward to Thank you. And uh, thanks for this opportunity. Luck. Best of luck and please stay safe. All the best to you too. Thanks, Irina. Thank you. Bye. Bye.